And now the Holy Spirit has multiplied into more than 10,000 disciples in 140 churches in 56 nations on all six populated continents of the world. Greetings, family. Elena and I bring you greetings from your sister churches in New Delhi, New York, Los Angeles, and just last week, Warsaw, Poland. Really appreciate uh, Victor and Sandra, the terrific job they're doing there and leading that great church. And uh, it's a real privilege to have Sandra's uh, parents here with us, Bill and Floor. Great to have you here. Uh, on the very first night, I, I, I started reflecting, wow, this is a family reunion that goes all the way back to Portland. Tony and Therese Antelon are here. Ricky and Co. Chalinar are here. Jason and Sarah Dimitri are here. Crystal Ching is here. Victor and Sonia Gonzalez. Kwaku Sarkodi. And my dear son in the faith and daughter in the faith, Michael and Michelle Williamson. You know, of those people, a lot of them are a part of the original 25. Tony and Therese, Co. Sarah, and of course, Michael and Michelle. I mean, it's amazing what a seemingly small and insignificant church can do to the power of God. So great to be here with one of my favorite speakers, Artie Baker, my daughter, Val Escajita, and congratulations to uh, Yuri and Shamika on their appointment, as, as well as Sean and MJ. And uh, it's, it's, it's great to be in an ever-expanding family, because now I just, just have children. I've got grandchildren in the faith. Tommy Waugh and Vienne, Caspar and Ashley, Anthony and Cassidy, Frank and Janae, Kobe and Rebecca, Paul and Rebecca, and the Gingers, Luke and Frankie. That doesn't even mention the great shepherding couples of Michael, Marie, Ola and Denise, and Jamie and Hillary. And uh, thank you for that great mercy presentation this morning. It's great to be family, amen? In Acts 17 and verse 6, in the RSV version, it talks about these are the men that have turned the world upside down for Jesus. But that wasn't the first time that God had turned the world upside down. We're going to study about the first time today. Give you a little historical background. You're familiar with the fact that David became king in about 1000 BC. His son Solomon comes upon the throne in about 970, and four years after he takes the throne, he begins building the temple because of all the riches that David had gotten from conquering the surrounding nations. By 930, though, the kingdom splits into a northern kingdom and southern kingdom, Israel and Judah. By 722 BC, the northern kingdom, God allows Israel, the northern kingdom, to be taken into captivity by the Assyrians because they had left God. In some ways, not long after that, about 100 years or so, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, comes against Jerusalem three times, taking exiles. 606 BC, 597 BC, and 586 BC, and that's when he completely destroys Jerusalem, the walls, and the very temple itself. You say, well, why? Because God wanted to show he was not with his people. However, 70 years after the first coming against Jerusalem, we find in Ezra 1 that in 536 BC, the Lord raises up Cyrus, king of Persia, and he sends the exiles back to rebuild the temple of God. Now, this was no easy task. The first time the temple had been built, I mean, they had so much money, so many resources. But the second time they go back, there were so few people. And instead of building a temple of gold, all they had was charred stones. And in some ways, this parallels what we've been through. 
I mean, the first movement, the ICOC, I mean, it was baptized in gold. We had so many resources, so many people, so many college students. And now we're in the new movement, and we're building with charred stones called remnant disciples. Well, the exiles did come back to, from Babylon to Jerusalem, and they started rebuilding the temple and its foundation. However, after two years, it was stopped by persecution. For 14 years, nothing was done on the temple. And then the Lord rose up two great prophets, Haggai and Zechariah. Rabbinic tradition says that Haggai was 90 years old and Zechariah about 18. Kind of like Ricky and me right there. <laughs> and very interestingly, we find that it's very well dated at 520, the second year of King Darius, this is when these men begin to preach the temple into existence. That's the power of preaching. It takes the word of God, and the word of God makes something out of nothing. Sadly for many, Haggai falls silent. All commentators believe he dies in 520. And so the young prophet Zechariah is left to preach the temple into existence. Very interestingly, we know from reading the book of Zechariah that one night in 519 B.C., he receives eight visions from the Lord. We are going to study about just one of them this morning. Let's be turning over to Zechariah chapter 4 to read about the fifth vision. You also by this time should have received the handout, which prayerfully will help you envision his vision. Now before we get into it, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, oil represents the Holy Spirit. Fire represents the very presence of God. This is going to surprise some of you. I'm going to be reading out of the NIV 2011. Yes. Here we go. Verse 1. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. Okay, stop right there. This is the middle of a vision, and he's getting woken up in a vision crazy. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand and a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels or tubes to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on the left. Okay, so we see that right here. You see the two olive trees, we see the menorah, the lampstand, and we see the big bowl and you see the tubes coming into each one of the lamps themselves. Now, we need to understand right here, olive trees produce olive oil, right? So we get a little hint right here of what is to come. And remember, fire is the very presence of God. And menorahs have what? Fire at the top, right? Verse 4. I asked the angel who talked with me, what are these, my lord? He answered, you don't know what they are? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So he says, this vision is all about accomplishing God's task, not by might nor by power, but by his spirit. And in particular, it's a vision addressed to Zerubbabel. Who is Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel is the prince of, so to speak, New Israel right here. He's not king because they're still under the kingship of, in this particular case, um, Darius. So he's prince, but he is in the line of David, and therefore later in the line of Jesus. Let's keep reading. What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone to shouts of, God bless it, God bless it. Then the word Lord came to me. 
The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares despise the day of small things? Since the seven eyes of the Lord that reigns throughout the earth will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. Now, don't confuse capstone with cornerstone. Cornerstones are the first stone that's laid to build a building. The capstone is the very last one. The beautiful capstone that, so to speak, caps off the work. And in the vision right here, he's saying, hey, Zerubbabel's going to have that capstone, and everybody's going to say, God bless it, God bless it, God bless it, because the temple will be rebuilt, and it is in 516. Amen? Keep going. Verse 11. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches besides the two gold pipes that pour out the golden oil? He replied, don't you know what they are? No, my Lord, I said. He said, well, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Notice it's not just the Lord of Israel. It's the Lord of all the earth. Are you with me here, church? Now, again, this completes the vision. We see the olive trees. They give oil into these two smaller bowls whose tubes or pipes go into the big bowl that then supplies the lampstand with light. Now, the question comes, who are these two individuals that the olive trees represent? Most commentaries are wrong. But we're a people, we're a people that believe in the Bible, amen? And we let the Bible interpret itself. Interestingly, in Revelation chapter 11, we have a very similar vision. And in this vision, the two olive trees are identified. And I'm sure you know who they are. The first olive tree had the power to turn water to blood and strike the earth with plagues. Who's that? Moses, right? The second olive tree shut the skies to have no rain. Who's that? Elijah. So, from an Old Testament point of view, Moses represents the law, Elijah represents the prophet, and so what do the olive trees represent? The very word of God. And so what he's saying right here, he says that oil, that of the word of God, which is synonymous with the spirit of God, then flows into the candelabra, into the lampstand, and gives light. Now here's the thing. In the Revelation vision, there are two lampstands. You say, well, why two lampstands? Well, the first lampstand represents the Old Testament people of God, and the second lampstand represents us, the church of God. And so we see that the Spirit of God is going to come into the lampstand, God's church, and we are going to be the light of the world. Does that fire you on up or not? My first point, wake up. Wake up. Isn't that the first thing the angel did with Zechariah? You know, Jesus talked about people waking up too. Go to Matthew chapter 25. Verse 1. This is the parable of the ten virgins. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Oh, hold it. Stop right here. This parable, like most, is about the kingdom of heaven. That's the people who are in God's church. These are baptized disciples. So the ten are baptized people. Okay, let's keep going. Verse 2. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. That doesn't sound good. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise, however, took oil in their jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, a cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. No, they replied. 
There may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later, the others came. Sir, sir, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth. I don't know you. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. Wow. That's a surprise ending right there. Amen. <laughs> now, a lot of us have a little difficulty with this parable because we really don't understand um, weddings and marriages in the time of Jesus. Basically, at that time, there were three parts to the Jewish marriage. The first was the contract. Well, this was arranged by the father of the groom and the bride, and basically, the groom and the bride had nothing to say about that. You say, that's strange. Well, we're still doing that over in India. In India, they don't date. <laughs> in our church, they say, okay, this is a great sister. You're a great brother. Next week is the big time. <laughs> secondly, secondly comes the betrothal or the engagement. Now, this actually is the marriage ceremony. Now, only the bride and the groom and the parents and a couple of close friends are there. Now, there's no sex after this time, but it is the marriage ceremony. But this explains some things in the scriptures that gets people confused. You know, they see that Joseph and Mary are engaged, but when Joseph thinks Mary got pregnant by another guy, he wanted a divorce. Because, you see, engagement in that day, actually the marriage ceremony had taken place. Amen? The third part is the one we're most familiar with, the wedding feast. This is where the bride and groom would invite the entire community to come share this special time with them. And, of course, this is really where the parable kind of picks up. So what happens would be that the groom goes over to the bride's home where the bride and the bridesmaids are waiting, and then the bride and the groom and the bridesmaids go through the streets with their lamps, see? Why? Because the weddings always took place at night. During the day, of course, everybody worked, and at night, it was a lot cooler than the day, amen? So they needed lamps to illuminate the way and to attract attention. The feast would end when the best man would escort the bride and the groom to the groom's house, place their hand in his, and then close the door, amen? The groom is Jesus. The bridesmaids is the church, you and me. Now, notice in verses 7 and 8, all the bridesmaids had lamps. Interesting. The lamp represents salvation. Notice, then, it says they all trim their lamps. What's it mean to trim a lamp? Well, you blow out an existing flame. You cut off the burnt wick. Then you pour and add new oil into it, very important. Then you re relight it, and it burns brighter than ever. Amen? Note, all had lamps, but not everybody had oil. Not everybody had the Holy Spirit salvation. And so, bottom line, what's that teach us? You can be in a fired-up church and still not be saved. Because you got to have your own oil, your own personal relationship with God. Are you with me right here? Well, what's the challenge of this passage for us? Very simple. We need to trim our wicks today. We need to blow out the past, good or bad. We need to cut the wick, either repent or rededicate. And then we need to add oil. Look over to Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans 10, 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Wow! Faith comes from the word of God. You know, I learned this as a, as a baby Christian. It was pretty interesting. At that time, I had not heard the Spirit's call to go into ministry. I was simply a pre-med student at the University of Florida. And every Monday night, I would host a 
you would call it a Bible talk. And I'd always be inviting the friends at my fraternity house to come. Well, one particular night, I'd been a Christian less than a year, one of the guys came totally drunk. And my minister was the guy that led the Bible talk, so I was kind of like embarrassed at this drunk guy in the Bible talk. I'm going, this is bad. Well, anyway, after the Bible study, which I thought he was completely out of, he goes up to my minister, Chuck, and he goes, um, he says, I'd like to find out more of what you guys are doing. And uh, Chuck says, well, you know, why don't you read the book of John? Next week, he shows up. This time, hair slicked back, nice clothes, dialed in. He comes up to us after that Bible talk, and he says, thank you for challenging me to study the book of John. I read the whole thing. I read it to figure God out, but I saw that God had figured me out. <laughs> Two weeks later, Bill Olseth was baptized into Christ. You see... You've got to get non-Christians in the Word of God to give them faith. The Bible's not just any other book. It's supernatural. The Spirit and the Word of God are one. It produces faith. You know, this year has been a very special year for me because um, I was baptized as a college freshman on April 11th, 1972, at 17 years old. And... And so entering this year in, in December of, of 2021, I go, you know something? This year, I'm going to turn 50 years old spiritually. That's, that's what I said. I said, I've got to do, I've got, I've got to do something. I've got to do something awesome this year. I mean, you know, as you get older, you get closer and closer to going home. You know what I mean? And you don't want that light to fade as you get close home. You want to burn brighter than ever before. Are you with me right here? And so then I remembered, if I'm going to burn brighter, I need more faith. I need more Holy Spirit. Hey, I already read through the Bible in a year's time, every year for a few decades. But since my spiritual birthday is coming April 11th, I'm going to start January 1, and by April 11th, I'm going to read all the way through. I've never read through the Bible that fast and be filled with that much spirit. Well, I did that. In the course of time, and I didn't really realize what was going on, only in looking back. In the course of time, I had been reaching out to my mom. My, my father passed away in 2017. I'm the oldest child, so I've been calling mom up every day for five years. I've never missed a day, even in all my travels. And, um, and so I've been making regular visits to go see her to help her with her doctor's appointments. And then the Lord put upon my heart. Now, remember, I've been reading the Bible. Holy Spirit's coming into me like never before. And I, out of nowhere, I go, you know something? Even though my mom is an open, see, when I was baptized, my mom and dad did not believe in Jesus, did not believe in the Bible. I was already the religious one. And so, but the Lord just put upon my heart, Kip, next visit there in early February, you need to give your mom a Bible. Not just any Bible, but a cranking new Bible. I go on the internet, I find this giant Bible, extra, extra large print. Beautiful pink cover. I put my mom's name at the bottom. And uh, I go visit mom and go, Mom, I got a present for you. Give her the Bible. She goes, Oh, son, thank you very much. I didn't think too much of it. And uh, I come back the next day. She goes, Son, I couldn't put the Bible down last night. I could read it without my glasses. So I felt the prompting of the spirit. I go, hey, mom, you know on the coffee table right there where it says first principles, that little book that I gave you a few years ago? You know, it's dedicated to you and dad. All the proceeds go to the McKean Scholarship Fund. She goes, yes, son. I said, how about we go through all those studies? I would be very honored to do that, son. And that's what we did the next few months. And on May 21st, 
Michael and Michael Adrian's spiritual birthday. My mom, at 93 years old, was baptized into Christ. The time is now to cut that wick, forget the past, and start burning brighter than ever before. I challenge you, if you've never done it, read through your Bible before the next EMC. If you really want to grow, read through the Bible before your next spiritual birthday. Bottom line, get serious with your Bible study. We have so many soapy books. I mean, Elena's book, Elevate. Um, Helen Sullivan's new book, Call to Change the World. First Love, uh, Jason's book, Cops. People read them, but you need to, you need to take time to go and look up the scriptures and let, let that Holy Spirit and faith come in you. You see what I'm talking about? Get serious about your Bible study and faith will come into you. And then... I challenge you, in this upcoming year of miracles, baptize someone in your family. You say, oh, oh, bro, I've been preaching to them and preaching. Read the word of God, get more faith. Are you with me right here? And baptize someone in your family. Are you with me here, church? It's time to wake up. Now notice what the Spirit said through Zechariah to Zerubbabel, Prince Zerubbabel. He says, there are mountains, there are challenges to building the temple. But the Spirit moves aside mountains and creates level ground. Are you with me right here? You know, the other night, one of the brothers said he wasn't speaking to you as an evangelist. I'm going to speak to you as an evangelist. <laughs> right now, with the addition of Ukraine and the Baltics, there are 42 nations in the European world sector. Presently, or I should say on January 1, we had 340 disciples exactly. It's been nine months into the year, up until September 30th, we have the stats. You've only had 107 baptisms. You've had 59 followers. What do I see? I see you have two mountains. One is the mountain of growth, and the other is the mountain of retention. Turn to John 15. The Bible says in verse 5, Jesus is talking, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in him, I, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit and show yourselves to be my disciples. You know, I think it's an incredible thing when people bring open non-Christians to us. We get to study with them and help baptize them, and that's part of being fruitful. But you know, it occurs to me that with only 107 baptisms, with 340 disciples, there are a lot of you that have not met anybody that's become a Christian this year. As a matter of fact, more than two-thirds of you are unfruitful in your evangelism. This is very serious. Why is this so serious? Because the Bible says Jesus promises that if you're in the vine, you will bear much fruit. See, I think some of us are faked out by being in a fired up church. I think you need to check your oil supply. Retention, wow, 59 followers. Almost a sixth of your members. How do we deal with the mountain of retention? How do we make that flat ground? Well, let me, let me share what happened 
about a year ago in Kiev, Ukraine. I was very concerned, very concerned about these very same things in what was then called the Eurasian world sector and specifically in Kiev. I said, you know something? It's time for me to go. So I set aside five weeks to be there to preach first principles and the act series. When I got there, I asked for the membership list and it said 86. After one week, just going through all the names of people that were faithful and giving, there were 68. So I had four weeks. So I organized the church into family groups, Bible talks. And while I was teaching first principles on Sunday, Wednesday, Friday, I was also working with the Bible talk leaders, family group leaders. And so what I started doing is early in the morning, while it was still dark, I would go outside and take selfies and post them on the Bible talk leader chat. So the first couple of days, I go, oh, nice picture, bro. Oh, that monument behind you is very famous. I come to staff. I go, guys, do you know why I post these selfies? And by the way, I hate taking pictures. But it was dark, so that was some consolation. I said, let's look at what Mark 135 says. While it was still dark, Jesus got up and went to a solitary place where he prayed. I want to challenge you to get up while it's dark. Go to a solitary place and pray. It's time to light your fire. You know, and I was, I was proud. The next day, the next day, a couple of the brothers, you know, put, posted their, their selfie, but not very many. So I said, where are the other selfies? <laughs> so, so then the sisters started coming in, the more brothers. So about the third week, I go, this is great. We all have nice selfies now. But we're not done. Yes, we're going through first principles. Yes, we're taking quizzes. Yes, we're taking very serious challenges from the Word of God as we go through the book of Acts. But now it's time to post in your Bible talk, your family group chat, your selfie. Calling every member to post their selfie. Why? Because I wanted to create a completely sold-out base. A sold-out base of disciples will always multiply disciples. A sold-out base of disciples will have few followers. The question is, how'd it go? Well, in the four remaining weeks, they'd only had 11 baptisms up to that point in the first nine months. In those four weeks, we had three baptisms and one restoration. So we had 72 disciples. I took them then, about half of them, to the European Missions Conference. That was great. But then I couldn't come back until January, and I brought the Untalans with me and the Causis, and I'll never forget the Untalans and the Causis expression, because I, I didn't know whether I'd really done it. The very first song, I mean, the Kiev church just blasted out. Go, oh, my gosh. Because you always can tell the heart of a church by its singing. Well, the war came. Disciples were scattered to Lviv, to Warsaw, to Amsterdam, even to London, a couple, uh, Germany, and Brussels. A year later, how many disciples of the 72 do we have? 71. Why? Because when you get people into the Word of God and close to God, they're going to be fruitful, and they're going to stay faithful. Are you with me right here? I want to challenge, not just the evangelists. I want to challenge all the Bible talk leaders here. Do Mark 135 and start posting your selfie on your Bible talk chat and see if it doesn't make a difference in your fruitfulness and your retention. Are you with me here, church? The last point is place down the capstone. You remember what it said in verse 7 of Zechariah 4? What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you'll become level ground. 
then he will bring out the capstone to sounds of joy. God bless it! God bless it! You know, uh, very excitingly, they did complete the temple in 516 B.C. And we really are living in a time of modern-day miracles. Uh, you will notice on your second page of your handout the church planting prayer list. And it's color-coded. Red means there are no sold-out movement disciples there. Purple means the remnant group. And green means it's planted. And at the beginning of the year of this year, the year of the Spirit, we had planned out, the World Sector Leaders had planned out for there to be 17 plantings. As of today, we have 28 plantings in the sold-out movement. And yes, uh, Stockholm is now green, amen. And Berlin is now green. Well, turn, if you would please, to Haggai chapter 2. The old prophet had something to say before the Lord took him. And we read in chapter 2, in verse 1, these words. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. To Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. And to the remnant of the people, ask them. Who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Now remember, Haggai's the old guy, 90 years old. He saw the beautiful old temple before it was smashed by God. Now he says, hey, look at the foundation of these charred rocks. Does it not seem to you like nothing? Jump down. Verse 6, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver's mine, the gold is mine. And God says, I have plenty of money. I'm just not giving it to you. The glory of of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. This is crazy. The former house was baptized in gold. It was almost mythological in its beauty. And here is this beginning of the present house of charred stones. He says, but the glory of the present house is going to far exceed the glory of the former house, the former temple. Well, how would God accomplish that? Well, what's he say right here? He says, in a little while, I'm going to shake the nations. I'm going to shake the earth. So what God does, he's telling through Haggai, he says, I'm going to take the globe of the earth. I'm going to turn it upside down, and I'm going to start shaking it like a salt shaker. <laughs> And the desired of the nations is going to fill up my temple so that the glory of this present temple is greater than the former temple. Who are the desired of the nations? They're the remnant disciples. They are the new baptized disciples in the sold out movements. And though we don't have the resources, though we don't even have the numbers, don't despise the days of small things. Because we're going to multiply. Are you with me right here? And I promise you, things are going to be much different than in the former movement. I'm asked all the time, how are things different in the new movement? Why aren't things going to crash again? Well, number one, we're unified in doctrine. In the former movement, I was never able to completely unify everybody. As a matter of fact, different world sectors would use different study series. Many of the world sectors didn't even have the kingdom study series. Didn't even use the kingdom study. Secondly, we're building family, not just inside of each world sector, but between the world sectors. One of the gross sins that hurt us was competition. And I hope and pray that 
You're praying for all the world sectors, not just the European world sector. You might be right here. Well, we're still hardline on sin like we were in the olden days, but we have a lot more mercy and forgiveness because all of us old people who sinned as a part of the old movement realize we need mercy and forgiveness. And lastly, the fourth thing that's the big difference, ICCM. We now have the ability, we now have the ability to train our young preachers and women's ministry leaders to know the Word of God, to infuse them with the Holy Spirit so that they can go out and preach so different than before. And by the way, I want to challenge, if you're leading a church, you better be in the master's program so that you can order and you can become part of an extension school in your city. Amen? Now, go to the last page of your handout. This is our Crown of Thorns project. Give you some perspective. The new movement started officially in 2007 with the planting of the L.A. Church with 42 disciples from Portland. And then the Lord, just two years later, put upon my heart a plan for the evangelization of the nations. Well, actually, it's Jesus' plan. We read about it in Acts 1-8 right here at the top. But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, our Jerusalem is the Los Angeles church. Judea and Samaria, well, that's the United States and Canada. And the ends of the earth, well, they're still the ends of the earth, amen? Now notice, on the page before, is Operation Eagle. This year, you'll notice that we have done 10 USA church plantings. You say, well, bro, that means you've got, out of 140 churches in the movement, 49 are Americans. Does that mean that you love the American more than us? No. But the American churches supply missions money for all the world sectors, including the European world sector. So we needed more USA disciples in order to have more money to plant more churches. Are you with me right here? And this year, $5 million was given by the USA churches for the sake of missions. Now notice, we're now in 37 of the 50 states in America. Lord willing, a year and a half from now, we will be in all 50 states in America. <laughs> now let's get to phase three right here. Phase three of to the ends of the earth is, is a three-part phase. Now, we broke it down to three phases. Number one is to plant the Crown of Thorns churches. The first Crown of Thorns church was planted in 2009. That was Santiago. So the other 11 cities that are named right here, they were either in red or in purple. So the first one, when we started this, only one green one, Santiago, Chile. Believe it or not, by 2017, eight years later, all 12 Crown of Thorns churches have been planted, the last one being Hong Kong. Now, we're into phase two, where these crown of thorns churches like London and Paris begin to evangelize their surrounding nations. Are you with me right here? And uh, this, is, this is getting exciting. Now, to be able to have targets that we can do, we have simply placed the nations that have a city with a population of one million or more on this list. Our goal is by the year 2030, in eight years, we will have this completely green. Is that awesome? So in actuality, in actuality, there are 34 nations on this list in Europe. And what have we done so far? Well, 2010, England. 2012, France. 2017, Ukraine. 2019, Netherlands. 2021, Scotland. And then, then I, I started to think, as we were singing that song the other night, even greater things. Remember the words? 
Take what I've been given, make it multiply. Take the life I'm living, make it touch the sky. You can take us higher than we've been before. Lord, you will inspire. You will always win. Even greater things than have been done before. Take what we've been have done and make it more. Even greater things through Christ our Lord. You know, amazingly, in 11 years in the European world sector, we've had five plantings. Tomorrow, we send out Ireland, excuse me, we send out Germany and Sweden. <laughs> and hold it. The Holy Spirit's already done Poland this year. You do three nations in Europe this year. Is that incredible? And I'm thinking to myself, okay, with eight, all we need to do is average three new nations a year by the year 2030, and we get this job done. Next year, Lord willing, we're going to send out Ireland, amen? We're going to send out Belgium from Paris. And Michael and I were talking, maybe, maybe Gustav can take over Stockholm, and maybe uh, Kaspar can head down to Tallinn, Estonia. And maybe, maybe Berlin can get into the action. Tom and Dana can go to the Czech Republic. Let's just be honest. The easy nations of world evangelism have been done. It's going to take harder work and more courage than ever before. You know, I don't know about you. I'm, I, I kind of think to myself, what's going to be the last nation? Afghanistan? It's kind of secretive nations, you know, Afghanistan, North Korea, Cuba. No, no, not Cuba. We did that two weeks ago. Cuba's done. We got that one done. Maybe Sofia, Bulgaria. You know, can't you just picture Zerubbabel taking that last stone, that beautiful capstone, and lifting it into place with a little help? And putting it down on top of the new temple. Can't you just imagine that maybe because you have more nations to do than any other world sector. So you may be the last one to get the job done. But there's great honor in that. Can't you picture your muscle-bound world sector leader, Michael Williamson? Picking up that capstone of Bulgaria, taking it up, and everybody starts shouting, God bless it, God bless it, and then Michael just puts it down. Is that going to be a moment or not? Well, what's the challenge? The challenge to you personally and the challenge to the European world sector. Number one, wake up. Take the word up. Number two, the spirit moves aside mountains. Take the word side. Number three, place down the capstone. Take the word down. What's the challenge? Let's turn this world, let's turn Europe upside down for Jesus Christ. If you are asked to move to another church to strengthen it, just simply say, God bless it. If you are asked to be on a mission team, Simply say, God bless it. If you're asked to be on a mission team where you don't know the language, just say, God bless it. If you're asked to go to the full-time ministry, go, God bless it. You know, guys, we're living in an incredible moment. A moment when the glory of God is shining like no time before. We're living in a moment where we have seen 42 disciples from this little city called Portland that Elena didn't even know where it was on the map when we first moved there. 42 disciples moved down to Los Angeles, May 6, 2010. Plant the City of Angels Los Angeles Church. And now the Holy Spirit has multiplied into more than 10,000 disciples in 140 churches, in 56 nations, on all six 
populated continents of the world. Mark my words. This is not a movement of men. It is the very movement of God, and God bless it.